Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending today's Public Health Communications Collaborative monthly webinar. I'm John Auerbach, President and CEO of Trust for America's Health. As always, we try to select the topics that will be of greatest interest to you, and we've heard from many of you that you're getting lots of questions about travel and, and camp season. The public, the media, policymakers are asking questions like, how do we remain safe and COVID-free during summer vacations? How do we ensure children are safe at summer day and sleepaway camps? And how can businesses open safely to serve tourists? This webinar aims to provide insights into effective messaging and tactics for responding to these, these kinds of questions and communicating about the safest way to enjoy the summer months. To help answer the questions, we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and Dr. Mashika Roberts, the health commissioner for Columbus, Ohio. During the presentation portion of the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat section to all presenters. Our speakers will have time to answer several of them. And as always, today's webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be available on the Public Health Communication Collaborative website later this week, along with all of the previous webinars we've done on the Public Health Communications Collaborative. So please feel free to check any of those out as well as uh, the one that we're doing today. Before we get started, we want to get a sense of who's participating today, and we want to get your most pressing communication challenges. This helps us answer the questions later, and it also helps us plan for the future. In the WebEx platform, you can answer these questions, and we're going to show you two questions that we'd like you to answer. So these are on the screen. They'll, the questions are, what term best describes where you work? And the other question is, what is your most pressing communications challenge? So we'll take a few seconds while you answer those. And then once I can see the results, I will share them with you. We want to give you time to fill those in. Okay, the poll has ended. And so I'm just waiting for the results to appear on the screen. Let's see. Okay, so in terms of uh, what best describes where you work, uh, the Largest percentage of participants, we are happy to say, are uh, local health department representatives, about a, a third of those who are on the call. Uh, we're also happy that we have a large, the second largest group is state health department personnel. We really aim these, uh, these webinars uh, primarily for state and local health officials, so that's terrific. But we're also very, very happy to have others, including people who work in school settings, health facilities, and universities. Now, in terms of the second question, what is your most pressing cha communications challenge? Uh, I think this is the second month in a row we've seen that vaccine confidence is uh, the number one question that comes up. Um, about a third of the answers are, uh, are identifying vaccine confidence, uh, confidence is the key question. Uh, other key questions, though, are uh, what safety precautions are necessary? Trust in public health is a continuing question as well. So thank you for, uh, thank you for completing those. Okay, now we are uh, going to move to hear from our uh, really impressive speakers. And the first up, we will hear from Dr. Nirav Shah. And as I've said, Dr. Shah is the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And he's been a consistent and trusted voice in Maine's coronavirus pandemic response. He became the director of the Maine CDC in 2019 and he previously served as the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health. 
and he's now the president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, so he's a very busy guy. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mashika Roberts, the Health Commissioner for Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Roberts leads a team of more than 500 public health professionals implementing neighborhood-based approaches to address the social determinants of health and to address the wide range of different health issues facing the residents of Columbus. Prior to her appointment as health commissioner in 2017, she was the medical director and assistant health commissioner at Columbus Public Health. So with that, I'm going to turn things over first to you, Dr. Shaw. Great. Well, thank you so much, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for taking a little bit of time out of your very busy COVID schedules uh, to spend with us and talk about messaging communications, particularly as we start thinking about the summer. And what I'd like to talk about today are the different ways that we can specifically talk about summer travel with different lenses, one of which being a lens toward potentially increasing vaccination, the other being a lens toward potentially increasing trust in public health overall. Uh, what I wanna do is start by just framing how we here in Maine are thinking about the summer from a COVID and public health perspective. From our vantage point, summer is an opportunity for us to crystallize many of the messages that we've been offering for the past year. Messages that have focused on things like things people can do to stay safe, the things we need to do to start bringing an end to the pandemic, the incentives that we might be able to provide to folks to get them there, and then all the while providing ways to demonstrate that those good and difficult efforts will result in off-ramps to the pandemic, the loosening of certain restrictions, the increasing of capacity limits, the removal of distancing requirements. So we're trying to structure our messages partly with an eye towards safety, here's what you should be doing, but also with an eye toward what it will mean if we do all those things and do them well. So intertwining hope with incentives simultaneously. Now, what I really wanna talk about in, in, in particular is how we can use this travel piece in a manner to offer these messages in a way that's thoughtful, that's reasonable and resonant. And our focus as we go into the summer boils down to getting out. That is to say, getting outside which is a big component of the main summer, but as well getting out from the somewhat constricted living environment that so many of us, so many of our constituents have been in and out from the various constraints that COVID has been imposing upon us. So our overarching or our organizing principle is to urge folks to get out, get out from underneath COVID and get outside. Now, a lot of this is predicated on trust, and that was a theme that was raised in the poll just a moment ago. The success or failure of any of these messages is almost directly a function of trust. And what I wanna spend a moment talking about is the ways in which public health often frames or misframes conversations of this nature, because these messages are just that. They are a conversation, not a campaign. At this point in the pandemic, I venture to say that people are tired of hearing us as public health officials share scientific information in what can be sometimes very anodyne ways. So we're trying to take an approach in Maine that reframes the discussion to me about a conversation rather than just a campaign. We're framing summer travel as fun. It's an opportunity to be with family and summer travel being a venue or a way to get back to normalcy. Not in my family, no, no chance of that, but at least for a lot of families, some effort at using summer travel to be the first steps toward normalcy again. So our communication strategy tries to reflect this. In our view, we're trying to take a, an approach that's predominantly carrot, not stick. So for example, here in Maine, one of our more recent ads frames vaccination as just one of the things that we here in Maine do at this time of the year to get ready to be together again in the summer. 
And the ad framed vaccination is just one of those things you do in early and mid spring to be ready for the summer. No different from cleaning your grill and getting your canoe cleaned and ready to go and cleaning out your cabin. All the things that people do, vaccination is just one of those things that get us toward a normal summer. We're also using summer travel and travel in particular as an incentive to get vaccinated. Again, using the theme again of summer being that return to normalcy. The vaccine is the horse that gets you there. The other point that I wanna make though, before I close it out and talk, turn it over to Dr. Roberts is summer travel in my view is also a way to move away from what have sometimes been a very prescriptive approach to public health messaging throughout the pandemic. An approach that's focused on, you should do this, you should not do that. And indeed, sometimes, and I'll, I'll, I'll be a, a bit intentionally provocative here, sometimes in public health, especially during COVID, our approach to messaging has been as follows. That which is not absolutely commanded is absolutely forbidden. And as a result of that, I think as the pandemic has worn on, people have lost faith in some of the messages that public health offers because it's highly prescriptive at times. Our approach in Maine is to use summer and summer travel as an opportunity to reintroduce common sense approaches into the dialogue, which thus now have, I think, been difficult because of a public's desire as well to have clarity and specificity. But our approach going into the summer is not so much to tell people exactly what's safe and what's not safe, but rather start the question on the other side, which is to ask people what it is that they wish to do and then offer safe avenues and vehicles in order to do those things that they want to do. So using the summer as a chance to acknowledge that at this point in the pandemic, people generally know the boundaries we're gonna to try to flip the conversation and ask folks, what do you wanna do and how can we help you do that safely? Whether it's outdoor activities or indoor activities. And finally, I know I've used travel as an opportunity to foster more vaccination, but that's a lot easier said than done. And I recognize that, especially with varying degrees of hesitancy out there. There are some folks out there right now whose obstacle to vaccination is convenience. There are others who have earnest questions. And then there are some who still believe that the risks of the vaccine outweigh the benefits. And then of course, another group who is just set against any vaccine. I wanna end on this note. This is more general, not tethered to summer travel, but this is a more general note about vaccination. My view is that we're not going to convince any of the folks in any of those groups through more data or through lectures. Where I think we can help is to find common ground with them through conversations, that those take trust. And sometimes we view trust as a transactional matter or as a binary matter. Either you have it or you don't, but that's not what it is. Trust is just that, it's a conversation, or in some cases, a series of conversations that in tandem and in total can get us where we want to go. That's the approach we're taking here through things like meetings with the public or ways to answer their questions to start building that trust and use the foundation we've already generated to get as many folks vaccinated to get Maine back to being vacation land as soon as possible. So thank you all for the opportunity to join you today. I look forward to diving into the tactical aspects of this during the Q&A. I wanted to set the table from a strategic perspective, but I'm really looking forward to talking tactics in a bit. So John, thank you so much. I'll turn things back over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Shaw. You, you uh, I think you, you accomplish what we try to do with each one of these monthly webinars, which is really focus on messaging. And, and so I appreciate your flipping the question, as you said, in terms of how to have the conversation away from a don't do, do, don't do, to more of how can we help you do what you want to do. And, and so we'll hear more about that, I think, in the Q&As. Um, and now it's just a delight for me to introduce uh, another uh, terrific public health leader, uh, Dr. Roberts. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, John. And thanks for having me um, this afternoon and morning for those of you who are on the West Coast. 
Um, I too um, think of a lot of the same things that Dr. Shaw mentioned in terms of messaging. Um, I do hail from the great state of Ohio that has made a lot of news as of the last 12, 15 hours in terms of what our state is doing to encourage or incentivize individuals in our community to get vaccinated. Um, and so we are working alongside the state, obviously as a local health department to get our community vaccinated and our messaging really for the last six months or five months for sure has been how do we get people vaccinated in addition to all the preventive measures that we were talking about before we had vaccine. Um, so we continue to emphasize in all of our messaging the importance of wearing a mask, particularly when you're around others who are not vaccinated, staying six feet apart or maintaining that distance, washing your hands frequently, staying home if you're sick. And then obviously as of late, we've been adding the vaccine particularly when the vaccine was available to everyone. And here in Ohio, the vaccine has been available to almost everyone since um, mid-April. So um, that is good news. Um, our outreach, we use all forms of media when we are communicating. So we use our media. We have great social media followings and we have a lot of partner and community engagement. We have a list of over 400 partners that we send an update to the first day on Monday of every week, just what's going on, what's new and what they can do. Um, and we also have a paid multimedia campaign where we're working with our hospitals, city and county agencies or city and county government, as well as some private industry. And to Dr. Shaw's point, I couldn't agree with him more. One of the things I heard really um, early on, particularly when I was talking to our communities of color about how do I get this message to individuals about the vaccine, they were very honest with me and they said, we don't wanna see you. We don't wanna see the mayor. We wanna see our neighbors. We wanna see people who look like us, um, who we know and who we trust. That's who we want the messenger to be because that's who we're gonna believe. We've seen you enough. Yes, you wear a white coat, but we've seen you enough. We wanna hear from the people just like us, what their experience was, why they got the vaccine, how they felt afterwards. So we've really done our best to try to incorporate that in this multimedia campaign that we recently launched, we are using everyday people, um, black, brown, yellow, purple, all different walks of life to try to be the messenger um, so that it's not always the elected official, the person with the big title behind their name, but people that they know and recognize. Now, um, we have talked about the holidays, you know, that's usually something we focus on shortly before it happens. So. Now, last year, we had a very significant um, campaign about the 4th of July, Memorial Day, and all of those holidays where we know people gather. Um, like many other communities, last summer, we had a lot of protests going on. So we were really concerned. At that point, we didn't know as much as we know now about the virus. So we were really concerned about people gathering in large crowds for protests. So um, obviously, that's free speech. So we didn't want to really talk negatively about people engaging in that type of behavior, but how could we empower them to get them to do it safely? And so we had a lot of um, campaign and um, media campaign around that. And then one of our most successful social media ads was around the holidays, specifically around Thanksgiving. And I don't know how I came up with it. I think I came up with it because I was watching a commercial on TV um, for a phone, you know, how you text people. And so we have a family sitting around an island in their kitchen and in a bubble over their head, you could see how many people they've been exposed to in the last week. So, you know, a teacher who's been in the classroom, a physician who's been seeing patients, you know, a kid who's been in the classroom and is in soccer team. And so it really was trying to bring home the point that you think you might just be dining with six people in your family, but really you're dining with those six people and then everyone else they've been exposed to, trying to discourage those large gatherings at Thanksgiving. And that really went viral. And so that's what we've learned is it's how you tell the story and saying the basic words, wash your hands, stay six feet apart, that, that gets boring and it gets old after a while. So you have to find another way to tell the story. And I've been really proud of my team of being creative and trying to think out the box of how they could do that. Um, we also took advantage of Mother's Day. You know, what a great idea to give your mom the gift of protection by getting the vaccine around Mother's Day. 
Um, and so that got um, some attention as well. And now as we move forward to this multimedia campaign that again, we're doing in partnership with our four hospital systems here, as well as the city and county government and some private businesses, we're really trying to start bringing forth that message about, look, if you get vaccinated, how the world is gonna open up for you. You can hug your family again. You can go to drinks with your friends. You could travel safely by car. You could go camping, you could go hiking. There's brighter days ahead, really trying to show that optimism that we're all looking forward to um, when this pandemic is slowly starting to come to an end. I remind my residents all the time, this pandemic is not over. Um, we are going to be in this situation for a while that COVID-19 is going to be a risk for us, but there are all things we can do for all of us to stay safe. And the first thing is obviously getting vaccinated. But second to that, there are other things you can do. And kind of on that vaccination front, the other thing I tell people is, if you're vaccinated, great, kudos to you. But what I ask you, I challenge everyone to go find someone in your circle who's not vaccinated and talk to them about why they're not vaccinated and what you can do to try to convince them to get vaccinated. Because going back to the earlier point, individuals are more likely to trust and listen to someone they know and have a good relationship with than they do with someone in a white coat who they don't know or someone with a big title behind their name. Um, so, you know, it, the communication has been um, a lesson for me and, and for my team. I am blessed that I have a really strong communication team here at the local level, and we've been able to do some interesting things on TikTok, um, we've had to, we've been able to partner with others who you know have a, a good following and be able to take advantage of that to get information out. But it, it's really not this global, whether it's a mass media campaign or social media. To Dr. Shaw's point, it's these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so one of the things we did do is we funded really an outreach team. And we likened it to um, individuals who are trying to get out the vote and you know going door to door during a political campaign. So these are individuals that we've trained about the vaccine and about COVID-19. And they are literally going in neighborhoods, knocking on doors and having conversations with residents about COVID-19 and the vaccine. And obviously the goal is to encourage those individuals to come and get vaccinated. But we've learned a lot from that um, and it's helped. I mean, we have been able to get people vaccinated because of those one-on-one -on -one conversations that um, we've invested in. So we plan to do more of that. Um, we encourage people to go to reliable sources. Um, as the poll said, that vaccine confidence, all of the misinformation out there is real and we are constantly trying to overcome the misinformation um, that people come up with. I mean. I, I was um, informed the other day that one of our partners said they had staff that weren't getting vaccinated yet because they were waiting on the pill. And I don't know, we were all puzzled by vaccine pill. And there were people who really believe that there's a vaccine pill that's coming soon. And so, so much misinformation is out there that we have to dispel and then provide that factual information with. So I think I'll end there. Um, you know, we have a great social media presence. So if anyone wants to follow us, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Robertson. I, I hear very loud and clear that as we're thinking about summer plans, vaccinations are a key message, and that uh, if if people are going to be willing to be vaccinated, the uh, the trust factor and who's give, delivering that message is really important and, and appreciate those creative approaches that you've been um, adopting in um, in Columbus. So now we're, we're going to open uh, things up for questions for our two speakers. And you will see on the screen, Melissa Morales. Uh, Melissa has been looking at the questions as they've come in and she's going to be uh, either uh, asking the person who uh, asked the question to uh, come off of mute and ask it themselves, or she is going to uh, read the question on their behalf. So uh, there's still time though, so please uh, please enter additional questions in the chat. I'm gonna start with a, a question uh, for both of you, and, and that has to do with one of the issues that, that it comes up um, uh, certainly during uh, summer plans, and that's camp. 
that's uh, both uh, sleepaway camp, and but it's also day camp. And yeah, I think parents are now uh, making plans or thinking about what what do we do uh, in terms of uh, summer camps? How do we have summer camps that can be um, safe but also fun? Um, and so you both, uh, I know, have um, many uh, of your residents who are planning summer camp efforts. I think Maine is known as summer camp, the summer camp state. So I'm certainly, I know you are thinking about that, Dr. Shaw. So I'd like to hear each of you and, and what your conversations are like with, uh, with people in, in your communities. Dr. Shaw, want to begin? Sure, happy to. And, and you're right, uh, summer camps of all different stripes are a feature of the Maine summer. Uh, they're a part of vacation land, uh, as Maine is known. And so, um, the last year, we, I, I think, John, where I, where, I, where I think about this upcoming season is to think about it in, in, in contraposition to last summer. Uh, last summer, we began working with the camping industry and their medical directors to put together protocols that would help kids get here safely, to be allowed to be tested, and then have a safe camping season. Uh, and I'm quite proud of the success we had, uh, so much so that we actually published an MMWR on it. I'll I'll drop a link in the chat to the protocol that we worked with camps and their medical directors to put forth around testing, screening, and then distancing. Uh, our view is that that protocol worked. Indeed, we went all summer season with all the camps in Maine without a single outbreak in a single camp. So we're planning to build upon that success. Of course, this summer, the calculus has changed a bit around vaccinations, especially the news from this week. And so we're not just urging folks to get their kids tested before and then use of now point of care testing, now also where age appropriate to get the kids vaccinated, even if they can just get a first dose on board, then we can work with the camps if need be to get the second dose delivered when they get here. But I'll throw a link to the uh, to the MMWR in, which for me is the foundation, and then any refinements we make will only serve to further make camps safer this summer. That's great. Thank you for for putting that in, and we'll we'll make sure people have access to that with the um, the uh, on uh, Public Health Communication Collaborative website. Uh, Dr. Roberts, your thoughts about summer camp and the messaging there. Yeah, so, you know, we don't force, well, we have um, camps here. We had camps last summer existing, but we don't have a lot of camps in, um, that are overnight here in Columbus. So we didn't get asked that question, so we don't have as much experience as Dr. Shaw has. But obviously camps can occur safely. We know that our kids have been able to return to the classroom, and we've had um, very low numbers, not zero, but low numbers in the school. Um, so camping is just kind of an expansion of that. But this summer, you know, the vaccine is a game changer for that, that if kids can get vaccinated before they go to camp, we know we could greatly reduce the numbers, particularly in that age group 12 and up. Um, but I think it's about the common sense public health measures that we've been talking about now for the last 15 to 16 months. You know, masking, particularly when you're at indoors, um, keeping that distance when you can, but for the kids, I think the biggest one is washing the hands, you know, and I know that seems so simple, but it's so important and it's so effective at reducing the spread of um, viruses. And it's been clear how this pandemic has impacted our youth. And so getting back to some sense of normalcy by allowing them to go to camp and other activities is, is valuable in their development. And so we have to find safe ways for camps and other activities for our youth to continue, um, but making sure that the kids, as well as those who are um, overseeing the camps, are safe in the process. Great. Well, thank you both for that. I, I, I'm sure we'll have more questions about uh, some of our activities and how to have those become as safe as possible. Uh, Melissa, uh, uh, I'll turn to you for our first question from one of our participants. Yes, our first question is from uh, Bonnie Leko Shapiro, and this is for Dr. Roberts. And she wanted to know if you could go into more detail about how you connected with TikTok influencers. That she's discussed this at her local health department, but uh, they don't they don't necessarily have the time to figure out how to to start that conversation. 
Yeah, so um, I, I might have misspoke. I, I don't know if we um, engage with TikTok influencers. Um, we have a, um, we had a communications person in our mayor's office who had a pretty significant TikTok presence. And so we were able to use that. And um, he helped us get some messages out, not with me in it, um, but really with himself. And with um, it, it was very creative. Um, and so we relied on that um, resource that we had in the mayor's office to do that. And um, he had a pretty significant following. And so that was advantageous for us. Perfect. Great, thank you. Another question, Melissa? Yes, this one's from Sam. Um, what are some messaging or strategies that you have found to be most effective for young people, perhaps 12 to age 24? I think that's for either one of you. <laughs> Dr. Roberts, I'll, I'll let you kick, I'll let you kick that one off. Sure. Um, so for the young people, I mean, I would say that a lot of our messaging thus far has been broader. So it's been more family based. Um, I, I know we're doing this multimedia campaign um, with our partners and I haven't seen all the images for that, but there's one that's that's really good. Um, I like it shows a doctor and um, their family um, and how during the peak of the pandemic before vaccines were here, the doctor really distanced themselves from their young children because of fear of spreading the virus to their kids. And um, the, the kids just talked about how now they can hug their parent as a result of the vaccine. and. Um, so that was one that I think appealed to parents, I mean, to young kids pretty well. Um, we, we haven't done anything specifically with the teens that other than trying to remind the teens and their parents that if you get vaccinated, at least here in Ohio, if you were exposed to COVID-19, um, you would not have to be um, quarantined. Um, and so that has been advantageous for some, particularly those in sports, that's been an um, a good reason for them to want to get vaccinated um, on their own. And, you know, I think that's the thing that the kids don't like is they don't like the separation. And so if you can convey to them that getting vaccinated is a step closer to um, um, really getting rid of this distance that we've all been living with for the last 16 months, um, that's the message that I think has been most effective at getting at our youth. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add very briefly, you know, youth are interesting um, because you, I think for particularly those under the age of 18, you have two audiences. You have the youth themselves, but you also have to message to the parents. So right now, our focus, you know, by right now, I mean this week and into next week, our focus is on messaging to the parents. So we've got ads that we hope will be coming up soon that feature pediatricians in Maine uh, talking to parents about why the parents should urge vaccination for their 12 to 17 year olds. But then shortly thereafter, we wanna start talking with the 12 to 17 year olds themselves. And there it gets a little bit harder because a lot of the messages thus far have been thought of as making vaccination the cool thing to do or relying upon peer group pressure to normalize vaccination. And I think we have to have a tough conversation about whether we're okay with that. Generally, we don't think peer pressure is a good way to achieve outcomes, but here with vaccination, if it works in our favor, are we okay with it? Uh, I think I am, uh, but that may not be the predominant view. So we're having a tough conversation about how we normalize vaccination. Um, the 13-year-old the daughter of a close friend of mine here said that um, she wants to get vaccinated at her school where we're doing a clinic because that's where all the cool girls are getting vaccinated. Right? And you know, the one how thing- do, How do we think about that? I love that. The one thing I would just add as we talk about the, the older kids in this 12 to 24, so as many of you know, we have a large university here in Columbus, Ohio. And so we've been working really closely with the university and they've done an excellent job to get their students vaccinated. Um, but one of the things that we've started to do, and you know, I, I know many across Ohio have been doing it, 
is we've been going to where the people are. And so for our youth, you know, even for this 21 and older, we're, we're going to the bars. We're going to the part of town where they hang out. We're going to start going to the malls. We just went to a soccer game um, last week and we were able to vaccinate some people there. And, you know, what we heard loud and clear from individuals was, I want the vaccine, but it wasn't high on my priority list. So I hadn't gone out of my way to figure out how to get one. So having it here at the game when I'm already here is perfect. So of course I'll roll up my sleeve. And so I think particularly for that younger age group, we're gonna have to go to where they are and um, to get them to get the vaccine. So, so I think before we move off of that, you know, that's this is a hot question because, uh, you know, everybody I think uh, that is in local and, and state public health uh, this week is is having this discussion. You know, how do we shift to reach uh, this population? And clearly, you you both have, uh, have some creative thinking about that. And I guess I'd just like to dive a little bit uh, deeper, uh, and maybe ask it. You know, what what are some of the discussions that you're having? about for for the younger kids about the location um, for the vaccination about the messaging uh, maybe even about incentives we we've heard some states for adults that are offering everything from uh, a free drink an alcoholic drink to i think in uh is it ohio that that there's a lottery so there's there's a, a lot of adult incentives that are being creative hopefully to encourage people to uh, get vaccinated um, is there any corollary to that uh, for for the for younger um, for children and um, and you know what what are the ways to to think creatively about that that you've begun to have? Sure, I, I can start, John, on the on each of those three really briefly. First, on locations or um, the the rollout of locations, because I think what we're what we're doing here is and, I, and most every other state we're not doing anything unique in this regard uh, our first step with respect to adolescents and and slightly older kids is right now use the infrastructure we have the existing large-scale vaccination sites the existing pharmacies that are offering pfizer use what we've got step two will be a then a combination of getting vaccine into pediatrician and family practitioners offices we're hopeful that next week we understand that there might be some changes to the Pfizer EUA around handling that will greatly help. And then um, going straight to schools, which we're starting later this week and into next week. So school based clinics. Those are the, the I think that will be the crux of our childhood and adolescent vaccination strategy, existing infrastructure and then doctor's offices plus schools. Um, messaging, you know, again, Dr. Roberts noted and we're doing something similar messaging for us for this group is about getting kids back to normal getting some semblance of a normal summer going back to camp playing with your friends not needing to wear a mask indoors if you're playing video games all of those things that's how we're making the case for vaccination and then to the parents talking about the risks uh, of covid and then uh, not of the vaccine but of covid and then finally john on the incentive point you know we we have an outdoor we have a an incentive program for outdoors, I'm sorry, for adults, focused on getting people outside, free fishing licenses, things like that. Um, for kids, I, I think we have to be more mindful because there are additional considerations. Uh, we haven't rolled anything out yet. We're thinking about it, but nothing as of yet. Thanks. Dr. Roberts, any thoughts there? Yeah, so we heard loud and clear from the beginning, even before we started vaccinating kids, that location mattered. Um, particularly for our um, new American groups, you know, going to locations that they were familiar with and they were comfortable with. And I imagine that is the same for kids. So we're talking about going to our rec centers. We're talking about going to some camps. We're talking about going to some schools um, that um, have session for the summer or some that don't. And we know that's a good, usually a safe place for kids. Um, so that's one of the things we're, we're talking about going to our zoo. We're making plans to go to our zoo. We're also going to have a mobile unit that's going to go out and about in the community. Um, and I liken it to going around the neighborhood just like an ice cream truck. And we will be providing some incentives um, to those who choose to get vaccinated in that method as well. Um, so I think location matters and you've got to go to where people are and you've got to be creative. And the other thing that I've really, you know, 
talk to my team about is, you know, what success looked like back in February when we were vaccinating 2000 a day is going to be different when we go to the neighborhoods or when we go to a school and we have to be okay with the fact that we only vaccinated 25 people, but that's 25 people who were not vaccinated when we woke up that morning. Um, so really trying to just get our, our reference um, changed a little bit so that we realize that we're not going to have the huge wins that we had um, several months ago. Um, in terms of incentives, uh, if you haven't heard, yes, Ohio, um, our governor announced a very significant incentive yesterday to our residents. So adults um, 18 and older who have been vaccinated, there will be a weekly drawing for five consecutive weeks. And anyone who is vaccinated will um, be in the drawing and you have a chance to win a million dollars. So they'll be giving away $5 million to, um, to five different people. Each person will get a million dollars. And then for kids, the raffle for individuals 17 and under will be a free ride to any Ohio public university um, that includes tuition and room and board. Um, so wow. all five individuals will have the opportunity to win that. And so that's the incentive that the state has announced just last night. And um, we'll see if that works. We hope that it does. Um, in addition to that, you know, I've been working with some local partners here in Columbus to try to provide incentives, everything from, you know, a free hamburger, a slice of pizza, um, a football, a basketball, maybe even a backpack full of um, back to school supplies. I'm just thinking creatively of what people need um, and whether that will entice them to come. I can't say because we haven't done it yet. Um, but that's the, those are the kind of things we're looking at as well as going, like I said, to bars and um, areas or entertainment areas and malls where there's a lot of foot traffic and trying to get people there to get vaccinated. Uh, say for a minute what it's like to have a vaccine clinic at a bar. Well, we haven't done it yet, so I can't <laughs> say. Um, I, I have been clear with the bars and the staff that I don't want the actual vaccine clinic to be within the bar. So it will likely be outside um, in a tent, but near the bar. Got it. Well, you uh, Ohio certainly raised the bar, I'd say, in terms of incentives when you're offering uh, a million dollar lottery and a free college tuition. Those are, that's that's quite quite something. Um, Melissa, another question. Yes, and um, perhaps on the theme of some creative solutions to administration, uh, Scott Vaughn wanted to know, Dr. Roberts, for example, the soccer games you mentioned, how are you handling follow up and follow up vaccines? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when we went to the soccer game, we provided Johnson and Johnson. So we didn't need a follow up. Um, I have um, encouraged my staff that we need to think about offering a choice for individuals. So Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer, um, when we get there, because we will get there at some point, we will handle the second dose. It'll be here at the health department. We will not go back to the game because there's no guarantee that those same fans will be there for the next game. Terrific. Um, and then uh, another question on the topic of travel from Alma Quintero. Uh, could you please discuss the complex messaging to travelers after their arrival? So whether they're vaccinated and they quarantine for a certain amount of days, or if they're not vaccinated, or if there's recommended testing. Is there anything um, with messaging to travelers coming to your communities and states that you could share? I, I can start as, as a state that has a, a lot of visitors uh, throughout the summer. Our approach has has been to urge people to, you know, the old know before you go line. That's the approach that we take here with respect to incoming visitors. So we, we on the governor's travel website, um, which we make easy to find from any search engine, uh, we have really clear guidelines. I mean, crystal clear guidelines of what folks need to do before they come to Maine and once they come to Maine. Uh, the other thing that we have, uh, have, have made sure we didn't do uh, was we, we've avoided trying to have too many twists and turns in the decision tree because confusion makes compliance really, really difficult. Uh, the other thing though, in connection with that is that we've also removed a lot of our travel guidelines as more and more people across the country particularly from the states that Maine draws many of its tourists that they've come from. So no longer do folks who are vaccinated need to test or quarantine before they get here, for example. 
But our key has been to urge travelers to know before they go in the same way that you would download and check all the route maps for the hikes you wanna do or all the mountain biking trails you wanna do before you come to Maine. We just recommend that you make that one of the list of things that you do. Okay, can you just say for for a second, Dr. Shaw, what 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 is there a is there a a simple way of saying what out of state folks need to do when they arrive in Maine? Yep. Um, so initially, it was we we drew a line between vaccinated and unvaccinated. But then, not too long ago, we actually removed all of the travel restrictions on Maine. That is to say, um, if you you can come to Maine from any other state without needing to test or quarantine. And that's largely a function of the fact that there's been so much vaccination out there that those who are coming to Maine, particularly from the states where we draw most of our tourists, have prevalence and incidence rates that are equivalent to Maine. So there's no added risk epidemiologically of someone coming from another state. They don't introduce a new risk to Maine. So right now, as of today, John, anyone can come to Maine without needing to test or quarantine whether or not you're vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Dr. Roberts, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so here in Ohio, um, we no longer have any travel recommendations. We um, at one point had recommendations that if you were traveling to a state that had a positivity rate above 15%, that you were expected to quarantine when you returned to Ohio. Um, and travelers, anyone coming from that, whether you're a resident of Ohio or not, were expected to either avoid coming to Ohio or quarantining. Um, we've since got rid of that travel restriction and there are no travel restrictions to come to Ohio. I think everyone knows there are travel restrictions and things to think about if um, going internationally. And so, you know, to Dr. Shaw's point, you need to know before you go, um, there are some almost any foreign country you go to when you before you return to the United States, you need to get tested. And if you test positive, unfortunately, you will not be able to return to the United States. And I've heard some stories of people who've gone on great vacations, what was planned for a week that ends up being three weeks. And the last two weeks were not pleasant because they were in a hotel room and weren't able to leave um, because they were quarantined after they had a positive test. So I think it's really important for people to understand the risk involved with um, traveling, particularly international travel. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. Uh, Melissa, next question. Right. This question is from Tamara Gallant. She asks, do you suggest developing specific messages for target audience segments, such as by county or rural, urban, et cetera? I'm happy, happy to start that. You know, I think it's a mixture. So uh, the any messaging has to build on a, a common foundation. Uh, so we've had a statewide set of messages and ads and campaigns uh, that, that appeal to everybody across the state, north, south, east, west. But then, as with any group, there it, it's not so much necessarily a function of geography as it is that within any part of the state, the, the reasons for folks who have not wanted to be vaccinated may differ. Uh, so in rural areas, it may be rooted in one set of factors. In urban areas, it may be rooted in a completely different set of factors. So for me, what's more important is not so much the specific geography per se, but the, the motivating factors behind why that generates reluctance or hesitance. So that's what we've done here. We've, we've worked with different parts of the state, done some surveys to try to get a sense of what's motivating people's reluctance, and then use those to focus different messages, whether it's on social media, directly in person, or with trusted messengers in those areas, specifically in rural parts of the state with doctors. Uh, some of the survey research that's been done to date, much of it by the De Beaumont Foundation and Frank Luntz suggests that in rural places in the country, uh, to the extent that there is hesitancy, the one messenger who is effective is someone's doctor. Thanks. Thanks. Dr. Roberts, any additional comments on that question? Well, I obviously I am oversee a city health department, so it's a little different here. Um, but we do have to think about the different um, characteristics of our community. So the different racial breakdowns, the religious breakdowns. And so I think we've had a successful campaign um, taking all that into consideration by using faces that resemble our community. Thank you, Melissa. 
Wonderful. So our last question today, and we'll have a couple of updates to share with the group after we wrap up. How have you each approached providing guidance when we have vaccinated parents versus unvaccinated children, at least to date? Dr. Roberts, I'll let you kick that off if you wish. Sure, no problem. Thanks. So, you know, that it can still be an issue because we've got many people who have got kids under the age of 12. And so the guidance has been, you know, yes, you're vaccinated and yes, you know, maybe your significant other and other family members are vaccinated, but keep in mind your children are not. So as you think about traveling, your children are still at risk and maybe their risk of having severe infection is not going to be as as much as an adult's risk, but it's still there. Um, so making sure that your children, um, if you're going to travel with them, can follow some of the basic guidance. So if you if you are choosing to travel by plane, are they able to wear a mask for the full plane ride? You know, how do you think they will feel on a plane wearing a mask? Um, if you're not traveling by plane and you're traveling by car, depending on you know where you're staying when you go, are the people who you're going to be visiting at your destination going to be vaccinated? Are you going to be in a hotel? or a private residence? Um, have you thought about cleaning? Um, just you know the basic things that although you are protected, your children are not. And so you just need to be mindful of the same preventive messages that we were talking about before we had a vaccine. It's still gonna be very important for your kids because they are not vaccinated. Um, and particularly the mask wearing, you know, when people say, you know, I, maybe I wanna go to Disney or something like that. Again, asking that question, that sounds fun, but do you think your child will be able to keep a mask on because that's the expectation at Disney? And, and I think that's really smart. I mean, we've we've urged parents to do the same thing, which is, um, you know, recognize that your child under 12 uh, may not be as affected by COVID, uh, but they still can be, and there's still risk there. What I've urged parents to do is consider the risks of traveling against the risks of not traveling. Uh, kids have been affected by COVID in ways that we're just now starting to discuss more. And kids want to break. They want to get out. They want to be kids. And so I've asked parents here to balance those things and still think about making that big epic road trip or flying across the country, but just do so in a manner that's safe, just like Dr. Roberts outlined, making sure that masking is understood to be the norm, things of that nature. My view is that traveling can be done safely. Uh, you know, traveling, particularly on airlines, airplanes, goes into that category of things that a year ago we were really, really worried about. Schools, airplanes, camp, things of that nature. But thankfully, because of a number of structural factors, turned out not to be as risky as we were concerned about. So I think traveling can and should happen this summer. I just want to help equip parents to do it safely. Well, Thank you, you both. It, it, it's really clear how lucky Maine and uh, Columbus residents are to have the two of you as such good communicators, such clear communicators that really speak to what families' concerns are and answer those questions in, in um, skilled and effective and creative ways. So thank you for sharing those insights with uh, our listeners today. And um, at this point, I'll turn things over to Rhea Farberman. Rhea is the St Director of Strategic Communications and Policy Research at Trust for America's Health. So thanks again to our, our panelists and over to you, Rhea. Oh, Rhea, you're on mute, I think. I apologize. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you to our presenters, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Shaw this afternoon. So much um, robust information and, and such a great discussion. I, I learned a lot and I, I trust everyone did this afternoon. So thank you to everyone for joining us and particular thank you to our presenters. Uh, I wanted to share that we are, uh, as a compliment to this, this afternoon's discussion, releasing today um, a summer safety tips social kit. So uh, graphics that you can use on your social channels to help amplify uh, messaging around summer safety and some of the messages you heard this afternoon. It's available now on our on our website, publichealthcollaborative.org, and we invite you to download that and, and use it on in your own community level uh, communication. So that's available now. 
Next slide, please. Um, we'd also like to take a quick poll, um, stay with us another few minutes, and help us to help us understand what else you need from the PHCC. So take just a minute. We'll leave the we'll leave the survey open for a minute uh, and tell us what else you'd like to see. Is it more infographics? Is it more is it op-ed templates? Um, is it more Q and A? What else do you need uh, from us? Let us know. Another 30 seconds to answer. All right, we're just about to close the survey. It's now closed. Let's move on. We'll use this data internally for planning. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I want to announce that our next webinar, which we are planning for June, gonna gonna put this together and bring this to get bring this to you as soon as we can because we realize uh, what an important topic this is right now. So the topic for June will be COVID vaccination for children, answering parents' questions. We have one speaker lined up and are uh, looking for a second speaker. The first speaker will be Dr. Karen Remley, who's uh, currently the director of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities at CDC. She's also the former executive director of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's a pediatrician herself. So this is gonna be an important next webinar and we'll announce the date as soon as we have it. Look for your PHCC newsletter for that additional information. And finally, let me uh, remind you of how to reach us, where to contact us. Um, you uh, hopefully are very familiar by now with our website, publichealthcollaborative.org. There's also info at Public Health Collaborative for any questions or suggestions. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ph underscore comms, ph underscore comms. So thank you again to our speakers. Um, just uh, another terrific webinar. We hope you uh, are, I hope you're as excited about it as, as I am. So much good information and such a good conversation. And we will keep them coming. As I said, next up, uh, messaging for parents around children's vaccination. And we'll announce that date as soon as we can. Thanks again for joining us and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.